Schelling is offering a developmental account of the history of religion, an account of the growth of human consciousness from what we could call the collective unconscious. As such, Schelling's account has immediate relevance for those students of depth psychology, particularly students of the psychology of C.G. Jung, the psychology of archetypes. But Schelling's account also has relevance for Freudian psychology, the psychology of the development of the infant, for example, which also speaks of a process by which the nascent, non-egoic consciousness of the infant, safely enwombed in the mother-child dyad, passes through a stage of duality and negation in which the mother becomes other to the child, and because other to the child, the child's consciousness can become an ego, en route to a fuller integration, a fuller capacity to relate to reality on the assumption that the psyche contains within it an internal diversity. There's also another analogy to the development of the political as such, particularly as it's described in Hegel's dialectic of objective spirit. The state, according to Hegel, begins with the undifferentiated unity of the family by which the patriarch establishes unity by denying individual freedom of its members. This then passes through the negation of society in which the members of original families break free from the patriarchal tribe and become autonomous agents for themselves, entering into contractual relations with one another and constituting that negative space of freedom, which we know as civil society. But this negation is for the sake of a constitution of a new kind of unity, a unity enriched by difference, which Hegel knows as the state. Schelling describes a process in which humanity evolves from an essential relation to God, and here we use the term essential in a technical sense, essence by distinction from existence, this is the unconscious monotheism of the prehistoric stage before humanity has been sundered into a diversity of competing nations with diverse polytheistic systems. From this essential relation to God, humanity passes into an actual or existential relationship to God, which Schelling calls relative monotheism or polytheism. And in this actual or existential relationship to God, people experience the divine actualized and determined in a variety of pantheons and successive polytheisms. So there's a negation of that essential unity which holds humanity together and a movement into a diversity of actualities which sunders humanity in one sense, but also frees it in another, culminating in a third stage which Schelling describes as a true relationship to God or an absolute monotheism which means a knowledge of the existing God, the God who exists as ens necessarium, as reality as such, as a being outside of whom there is no diversity, but who for that reason includes all diversity within himself. So we need to keep distinct here these three different relationships, an essential relationship, an actual or existential relationship, and a true relationship. And it shouldn't be hard for you to, to distinguish these three on the basis of your knowledge of the three potencies. Remember, the first potency is the subject without a predicate. The second potency is the predicate in abstraction from its subject. And the third potency is the subject and the predicate united in the full proposition. So in the first stage, humanity, who is by essence the God-positing being, humanity says, God but adds nothing to it, like a speaker who utters a subject without completing it in a predicate. This is not a knowledge of God because there is no distinction between subject and object. There is no egoic consciousness, which is necessary for knowledge. One who has an immediate immersion in a subject matter doesn't necessarily know it. Think of how when you're immersed in an experience that's particularly pivotal for your development, let's say a life-changing trip, or a particularly important relationship. One really doesn't know what is going on and why it's so important when one is in it. One actually needs some distance from the experience to know why the experience is so important, to know what the experience is as such. The experience, in order for it to be known, has to be in some way past. 
And in the second stage, we have humanity uttering a predicate without its subject. Humanity objectifying divinity as Zeus, Brahma, Ra, without, however, conceiving these determinations as determinations of the infinite divine outside of whom there is nothing. And then in the third stage, the full proposition is uttered and we arrive at genuine religious knowledge of the infinite God. We say, God is Zeus, Brahma, Ra. We unite the subject and its predicate. And when we say God is Zeus, Brahma, Ra, etc., and understand what we say, we also know that God is not exhausted by any determination. God is not exhausted in his manifestation or representation as Zeus. God is not exhausted by his representation as Brahma. God cannot be identified with Zeus, Brahma, and Ra without remainder, because God as infinite exceeds any objective predication which we might apply to him. So in the first stage, under the compulsion of the first potency, we experience divinity, but we know nothing about it. In the second stage, we know that gods exist, but we don't know what they are. And in the third stage, we know that gods exist, or rather gods existed, since polytheism is irretrievably the past. God existed as gods, and thus we know God as essentially diversified within God's self. With this comparison of Schelling's history of religion to the developmental psychology of Freud or the history of the state of Hegel reveals is the irreversibility of time. For Schelling, you can't go back because who you are now depends on who you were then. And who we are now as a species depends on who we were then as a species. This irreversibility of time, Schelling expresses in the Freedom Essay as the law of the ground. And I'll draw your attention to one sentence in the Freedom Essay. This is on page 17 of the Love and Schmidt translation of the Philosophical Investigations into Human Freedom. Schelling writes, The dependent, whatever it also may be, can be a consequence only of that of which it is a dependent. He calls this the law of the ground. What this means is that for something to be dependent upon an antecedent is an irreversible relationship. The antecedent as the ground of what the dependent is cannot be reactualized. The relationship cannot be reversed. The antecedent cannot be the consequent of itself. In the ontotheological tradition, Thomas Aquinas spoke of this as the impossibility of a thing being the cause of itself, because then it would have to pre-exist itself. And this is also the paradox of every time travel narrative. To want to go back would be to want to bring who we are now back to who we were then. But if we brought who we are now back to who we were then, we would change who we were then, and who we are now would cease to exist. Now, there are two principal ways, I think, in which we try to go back to who we were in terms of the history of religion. One is mysticism, and the other is nationalism. The mystic, and by the mystic here we mean the non-dualist, so a certain branch of mysticism, which denies the reality of personality, the reality of time and history, just as they deny all distinction between things. The non-dualist mystic endeavors to go back to that first stage of human religion in which we were in an essential relationship to God by virtue of lacking all consciousness of God and all consciousness of self. The great irony is that Schelling, who is widely regarded as the mystic among the German idealists, is most explicitly critical of this move. And I turn your attention then to a passage in Lecture 8 of the Historical Critical Introduction of the Philosophy of Mythology, in which Schelling quite clearly regards this kind of mysticism as regressive. Quote, Indeed, the teaching that maintained that man only is in order to posit God would be fanatical. This teaching of the immediate positing of God by man would be fanatical if one, after man has made the great step into reality, wanted to make this positing of God into the exclusive rule of his current life as happens with the mediators or the contemplatives 
the yogis of India or the Persian Sufis, who, internally torn apart by the contradictions of their faith in the gods, or weary in general of being and thinking subordinated to becoming, practically want to strive back to that disappearance into God. That is, like the mystics of all ages, find only the way backward, not however forward, into the true knowledge. End quote. This whole critique depends upon where one is in the history of religious development. If one wants to go back to the immediacy of a relationship with God, which is untroubled by actuality, in which there is no sense of separateness, in which one has no ego consciousness, in which one is not yet a person, after one has made the great step into reality, this becomes fanatical, this becomes regressive, this becomes a flight from reality. The yogis of India and the Persian Sufis, Schelling writes, are tired of being. They are weary of existence. They can no longer tolerate existence that is caught up in a process of becoming. So the incompleteness of existence, the processive nature of existence, the despair and anxiety, the desire and the frustration associated with being in time, all of this is something they flee from in their return to an immediacy which is conditional upon the annihilation of their consciousness. This, however, is a way backward, not a way forward. 